Hello and welcome to the AMA Update video and podcast. Today we're taking our weekly look at the headlines, including COVID and flesh-eating bacteria with the AMA's Vice President of Science, Medicine and Public Health, Andrea Garcia in Chicago. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer, also in Chicago. Welcome back, Andrea. Thanks, Todd. It's, it's really good to be here. Well, I hope you had a lovely Labor Day holiday weekend. Uh, over the weekend, of course, COVID headlines all over the place. Andrea, what do we need to know? Yeah, according to the CDC, even before we hit the holiday weekend, we were seeing a, a significant rise in cases and hospitalizations. There were more than 15,000 new COVID hospital admissions for that week ending August 19th. That was about an 18% increase from the week before. Overall, though, we've seen nearly an 87% increase wow. over the past month. And that increase has been happening now for seven straight weeks, and it's expected to continue. The CDC reported, based on some modeling forecasts, that it expects anywhere from 1,700 to 9,700 daily COVID hospital admissions by the end of September. And while none of this sounds like great news. If we put it in context, we're still down almost 61% in COVID hospitalizations compared to where we were last year at this time. And again, I've been reading that it's largely being driven by a new variant. Have we learned anything new about that? Well, EG5 or ARIS is continuing to spread quickly. And as a reminder, EG5 became that dominant variant here in the US in August. It has been classified as a variant of interest by the World Health Organization. And that hasn't changed. According to the New York Times, uh, experts um, still believe that EG5 does not pose a serious threat like previous variants, um, those who are older, those who have underlying conditions are at higher risk of severe outcomes. The WHO stated in a recent announcement that based on the available evidence, the overall public health risk posed by EG5 is evaluated as low at the global level. So that's good news. Andrea, why does it seem to be spreading so rapidly right now? Well, EG5 has one notable mutation that helps it evade antibodies developed by our immune system in response to earlier variants and vaccines. That's most likely why it's become not only the dominant strain here in the US, but in the world right now. Cases, however, from this variant seem to be relatively mild and the new vaccine formulation that is ex expected to be rolled out later this month um, is being developed based on another variant, XBB 1.5, and that's more genetically similar to EG5. So in theory, it should provide better protection than our current vaccines do once it's available. And as we discussed last week, treatments like Paxlovid are still effective against it. That's good news. What about the other variant that we talked about last week? I think you called it Parola? Yeah, Pirola or BA286, it's also spreading um, and it's now tied to about 29 cases worldwide. However, ex experts expect that that is likely an undercount. In the US, it's now identified in five states. So Michigan, New York, Virginia, as well as Ohio and Texas. And scientists continue to be a little more concerned about this one, even though that case count is still very low. And that's because there are so many mutations and many of them are in the spike protein. So it could make it more difficult for our immune system to recognize it. So Andrea, does that have implications for the new vaccines that we're expecting? Yes, yeah, so the concern is that those updated vaccines may be less effective against it. However, over the past week, there have been several studies posted on social media these studies have not been peer reviewed, but overall this early data shows that the evasion of existing protection is not as bad as we initially feared and this new variant might not be as transmissible. One study showed that across a range of different types of immunity, people were able to neutralize BA286 um, and, and sometimes even more effectively than other circulating variants, those people with the highest neutralizing antibodies were those that had recently recovered from an XBB infection. 
this suggests that the new vaccines should provide pretty good protection against BA286. Again, that's encouraging. It's still early. Studies are still ongoing. So this is an area that we're going to continue to track. And with fewer people testing, how can we expect to get and track the kind of data that it's going to take to keep an eye on this? Yeah, well, surveillance efforts have certainly decreased. I think one important tool that continues to be available is wastewater data. That wastewater sampling is how officials in New York City first detected BA286. Officials uh, said that that sample did not come from a local resident, but whenever you find a variance present in wastewater, it means that it's circulating. Public health experts have previously said that wastewater tracking is a good early detection tool for monitoring potential future upticks. And this is gonna become even more important as people continue either to not test or to test at home and then not report results. Um, With that being said, I think we're, we're hearing those anecdotal reports that pharmacies are seeing that increased demand for both in person and at home COVID tests. And some have even said that we could see a temporary or isolated shortage in these tests. So many people are still testing, which is good news. As always, it seems to be the case, COVID is not our only concern. Last week, we had a CDC health alert about malaria. And this week, we have a new alert. And uh, news flash: it does contain the words flesh-eating bacteria. That is certain to generate a lot of headlines and a lot of concern. Andrea, what's the scoop here? So the CDC issued its latest health alert network or HAN advisory on Friday, and that was about a recent report of fatal Vibrio vulnificus infections, including both wound and foodborne infections. Vibrio are bacteria that caused an estimated 80,000 illnesses each year in the US, and about a dozen species of Vibrio are pathogenic to humans. Most people with Vibrio infection have diarrhea. Some might also have uh, stomach cramping, nausea, vomiting, fever, and chills. However, the species that is the subject of this particular alert is known to cause life-threatening infections. And these cases are usually the result of being exposed to bacteria in warm coastal waters where it thrives. But the infection can also be attained through contact with contaminated shellfish, such as oysters. It's especially dangerous if it comes into contact with open cuts or insect bites or other exposed wounds because it can cause necrotizing GIDIS, which kills the skin around a wound and can rapidly make some people very ill. And that's why it's sometimes more commonly referred to as flesh-eating bacteria. We know that about 150 to 200 B. vulnificus infections are reported to the CDC each year, and one in five people with this infection die, uh, and sometimes within one to two days of becoming ill. Well, that's pretty scary, and it seems like we've been hearing about this problem for some time. Why all of a sudden are we getting an alert now? Well, most cases happen between May and October, and it's obviously become worse with climate change. Vibrio naturally live in coastal waters, including salt water, brackish water, which is a mixture of salt and fresh water. The bacteria thrive in unusually warm water and um, can increase with extreme weather events, such as heat waves, flooding, and severe storms. During July and August, we've experienced above average coastal sea surface temperatures and widespread heat wave. Um, During that period, several East Coast states, including Connecticut, New York, North Carolina, have reported severe and fetal B. vulnificus infections, which is why we're seeing this alert come now. So kind of another reminder about climate change and the impacts that we can experience from that. Andrea, what do people need to know? Well, people who are at increased risk for infection should exercise caution when engaging in coastal water activities. Stay out of salt water and brackish water if you have an open wound or a cut. If you get a cut while you're in the water, leave the water immediately. If open wounds or cuts come in contact with salt or brackish water or things from undercooked seafood, wash them thoroughly with soap and uh, clean running water. And then prompt treatment is really crucial. So it's important to seek medical attention immediately if you suspect an infection. 
And how about physicians? What do they need to know? Well, physicians should consider the vulnificus as a possible cause of infection in wounds that were exposed to coastal waters, especially in patients at higher risk for severe infection. Uh, that includes those with underlying health conditions such as liver disease, diabetes, or, or the other immunocompromising conditions. Uh, if infection is suspected, obtain cultures, send them to your public health laboratory ask the patient or family about relevant exposures and initiate treatment promptly. Early antibiotic therapy and surgical interventions do improve survival. It's important not to wait for consultation with an ID specialist or laboratory confirmation um, than just to initiate that treatment. Uh, vibriosis is a nationally notifiable disease. Healthcare professionals and clinical labs should report all of those cases to their state, local, tribal, or territorial health department. Um, and we should also just be informing residents and tourists in these coastal communities about the risk of the vulnificus infection uh, with signage on beaches and near waters uh, that may be affected. Andrew, that's all very helpful information. Note to self, I probably shouldn't have gone kayaking in the Long Island Sound last weekend, but I'm still here this week, so that's good news. Andrea, thanks for being here and taking us through all this important information. That's it for today's AME Update. You can find all our videos and podcasts at ama-assn.org slash podcasts. Thanks for joining us. Please take care.